Our own Becky Connor, Lacey Gorenson, wrote this episode of The Connors. It's her first effort since season four's very memorable Triggered. Let's talk about fire and vice. Hey guys, Dan here. This is Dan Reviews It. Welcome to my Connors review for episode 11 of season 6. We've just got a couple of more to go uh, with the season 6 coming to a close very soon. But uh, I have gotten word that season 7 is upon us. And unfortunately, it will be most likely the last. They're going to do a six-episode wrap-up for season seven that uh, really is going to be an extension of what's been going on in season six. I think part of the reason for that is because of the strikes pushing everything back. This would have been probably a 20 or so episode season. Now it's down to 13 because it couldn't start till January. Um, but I really had hoped that the addition to the show on Netflix and going into syndication this fall and being on the CW this spring, uh, and now apparently it is on Tubi as well, um, that that would have sparked renewed interest in the series. Um, but apparently the suits at ABC have decided that uh, perhaps this next outing of just six episodes will be the last. I really hope that that's not the case. I hope they're going to change uh, their, their course on that, but for now, that's what we've got. But look, at least we do know uh, that there will be six more episodes so the Connors can have a proper send-off. I think that is appropriate. It's it's interesting because um, the ratings are, are quite high. It is the number one comedy on all of ABC, and it is uh, not number one in the demo. That is Abbott Elementary. The main demo they look for is 18 to 34. So that's Abbott. But uh, in overall viewers, the Connors is number one. Um, and I imagine it's probably... Uh, other than maybe a couple of the ones on CBS, like Young Sheldon and um, Ghosts on Thursday, it's probably one of the top comedies on television just overall. Um, but, you know, I could be wrong on that. But anyway, for ABC, it is their top comedy. So it's a shame to uh, maybe see this one wrapping up. But at least we will get uh, these six more episodes uh, coming in the fall. All right, so... Uh, without further ado, uh, let me welcome you into Dan Reviews It. Thank you for finding this video. We do Connors Reviews every single week that there is a new episode. I've been doing this for years and years, um, and we'll have two more episodes this season. Like I said, the, I'll be covering those, but uh, for now, it is episode 11 of season 6. Uh, but please consider subscribing. Hit that like button as well, uh, or comment below. I love hearing from the Connors fans like myself, and uh, I love interacting with you guys about you know your favorite parts of the episode or, or what grade you would give a particular episode. Um, so hit me with those, of course. Like I said up top, this was written by Lisey Gorenson. And, of course, we have had uh, the episode Triggered from Season 4. Very memorable. Um, definitely one of the best of that season. Um, so she wrote that one, and uh, this one... Is, is I think just her second effort. I don't believe she wrote any of the uh, original Roseanne episodes or anything. I think Triggered was her first, and it was a very powerful one. And this one um, definitely brings some laughs, but uh, Becky's story is a very powerful one, once again. So um, we'll get into that uh, in a moment. This was directed by Robbie Countryman, who uh, has directed, uh, I mean, at least a third of the episodes this season. I don't know. I didn't count specifically, but he's done uh, quite a handful. And, you know, he, he goes back many, many years on the Connors. So no surprise there. And and that's nice when, um, you know, Lisey probably, or Lisey or L Lishi, I'm not sure. Because her real name is Alicia. So whatever. But um, in any event, Ms. Gorenson, we'll call her. Uh, but, you know, it's nice that she was able to pair her writing with a veteran in the director's chair, um, you know, because, she, you know, she's probably a little nervous, um, you know, not not being a huge part of the writer's room, you know, of this show. But um, I think she's churned out some really good ones. You know, Triggered was great. And uh, this is a, a pretty good one as well. We'll get into the reasons why here uh, right now. So Fire and Vice is the name of it. We're going to actually start with a topic that is not mentioned in the title, and that is Louis. Won her school board, uh, de well, not debate, but the uh, she won the the spot on the school board or whatever, um, and that is how the episode starts. They're all kind of, uh, you know, watching the results on the internet and, and trying to to find out, okay, you know, which which ones uh, in the lead is it uh, Louise or this other gal that we met last week in the debate, um, and it was neck and neck. It looked like Jackie had mentioned uh, maybe putting up some 
horrible film that uh, was doctored to make it look like uh, this woman was abandoning a dog at the shelter. And I have to say, uh, you know, I have to imagine this episode was written before all this stuff uh, with that woman in uh, what, Congress or, or whatever, um, Christy Noem, uh, killing her dog or whatever. Look, I don't follow a lot of politics because I know where I stand. And it's just a lot of uh, noise to me. But um, but I did see that there was, you know, the, this big story blowing up. So this had to be written before that. But man, that was a, a really nice sort of uh, coincidence of timing, I, I would say, about, uh, you know, let's, hey, Louise, let's, let's make your uh, opponent look like a dog hater. Um, you know, very, very interesting. Um, that actually didn't occur to me to write this second as I'm talking about it. But man, that's... That's uh, that's pretty nice timing. But um, in any event, she's won the school board uh, vote. And so hopefully we will see uh, more in the next, you know, maybe couple of episodes coming up or maybe those six that we're going to get in season seven um, of her actually being on the school board. Because that's kind of the only time they really mentioned it uh, in this episode. This wasn't about that. Um, so we'll talk about the other things of this episode. The fire uh, is a uh, fire at Ben's hardware store. Um, in the opening of the episode, he is talking about this, um, article that he wrote for Hardware Magazine. That is a holdover storyline from last episode. Uh, Jackie and Darlene both think this is a super, super boring article that he's writing. He's telling them about this father and son and how they want to build their, this bunker together um, and all of that. And I I, th I thought it was, you know, some, some decent storytelling, but, you know, they, of course, have to give him some grief. Um, and all of a sudden, Mark comes in and he says, hey, uh, did anybody call you guys from the fire department? Um, I, I just passed the hardware store and the street was blocked off and it looked like smoke was coming from that store. So they go down there and sure enough, everything is gone. And this is a pretty famous, um, you know, go-to storyline with sitcoms that honestly are maybe a little bit long in the tooth. Um, Cheers did it in, I want to say season 10 of their 11 seasons. The bar was burned down. Uh, Rebecca was smoking and just, uh, you know, loose cigarette or whatever. Um, and I remember uh, it being on Happy Days as well. Uh, Chachi burns down Arnold's. And I was like, I don't know, five or six when that episode aired. And I was so upset and I was freaked out that my house was going to catch fire and all that. And then a few years later on the Hogan family, their house caught on fire and it was horrible. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I, I don't love uh, fire storylines because it gives me some anxiety. But in this particular case, uh, Ben looked at it as actually a, a gift from God. Um, you know, which is funny because they were all sort of sitting around and talking about, um, you know, hey, we, we have insurance. He had to look into that. That was something that we didn't know right away, but he called his mom. I thought we might get a Candace Bergen appearance, but we did not. Um, but he called it her and, and it turns out, yes, they had this great insurance, which makes sense because I think, look, in this day and age, insurance is expensive and maybe we don't have the, the coverage that we would like on certain things, but this hardware store was handed down to him, uh, from his father. And so, makes sense that there would be a ton of insurance on it. So they're all kind of celebrating. Amen. You know, Darlene's like, hey, Ben, can I get an amen? I Even I gave you one and I'm an atheist. Um, but it turns out Ben actually had some other thoughts, uh, such as talking to the guy at the hardware magazine and he was actually looking to sell. So Ben uh, is, is deciding, hey, instead of rebuilding the hardware store, something that Ben didn't even really want to do in the first place. You know, it was handed down to him, uh, and it's it's not like it's his passion. Writing is his passion. And, uh, you know, I guess the articles in the magazine have, have been pretty good. I, I would assume, I don't know if it's a weekly or a monthly magazine or whatever, but um, the, the timeline's a little weird on this because uh, unless the uh, the voting up to the school board takes weeks or months, which I guess is possible, but he said that the, his articles have been pretty well received by the magazine. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure. I, I can't imagine Hardware Magazine, which I don't think exists. I can't imagine that's a weekly. Um, you know, I, I would think that's a monthly. So maybe a couple of months have passed since the last episode. I'm not really sure. But uh, in any event, he says maybe he just means that they've been, um, you know, critically liked by his peers at the magazine. You know, maybe the editor likes them. Maybe that's what he meant. I don't know. But um, when he said they've been well received. But in any event, uh, he's going to buy the magazine. Him and Darlene have uh, not a fight, but certainly a discussion 
about it because she thinks that's very risky. Um, you know, the only reason I took this job at the cafeteria, not only to help Mark, of course, but the only reason I felt comfortable doing that is because we had job security at the hardware store uh, and this and that. But to me, I, when she said that, I thought, boy, in this economy, is the hardware store really a uh, a safe bet either? You know, a mom and pop hardware store that, by the way, got robbed like, uh, you know, a month ago or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's certainly a lot of mom and pop stores closing all over the country, uh, hardware and otherwise. So I'm not sure if that is the most secure gig either, but whatever, um, you know, it, at least maybe she figured if he sold it or something, he would make some money from that. But apparently they got a lot of money and, uh, he talks about sort of how much, uh, towards the end. But anyway, uh, Darlene does not want him to do it, but he says, look, this is my passion writing. I want to do this. Uh, I, I want to buy this magazine. When we started that, you know, Gossip Rag magazine, it was in the pandemic and whatever. Um, and this magazine has a built-in fan base and, and et cetera. So she she goes along with it, but she is worried about how Dan is going to take it because, of course, that is, at this point, his only source of income. Um, so him and Louise come over and they're going to break the news to uh, to them. And, and Ben's like, look, you know, you can you can hit me if you want to, Louise. You can hit me, not Dan. Um, but he tells them that he's actually giving Dan ten percent of the insurance uh, money because, and this makes sense. And look, Ben, ben is such a stand up guy. This is great um, because he owned ten percent of the hardware store. I had forgotten about that. I guess that was maybe a season or two ago. I forgot all about that. Um, and, and that maybe Dan did too. I don't know, but, uh, in any event, it's a nice sort of windfall. And he says, uh, that it is in the upper five digits. So, you know, maybe 80,000, 90,000, something like that, which means if that's 10%, um, then Ben got probably somewhere close to a million dollars, uh, for this, uh, insurance claim. And, you know, if, if that's what, uh, it takes to buy the magazine, then great. Um, th then we'll go from there and hopefully we'll get to see a little more of that in play in subsequent episodes. I think this is awesome. Um, you know, I, I think the hardware store definitely kind of ran its course, uh, on the show. Um, it actually reminds me a little bit of Dan's bike shop because, uh, of course that was a, a passion project for him, not like Ben's hardware store is for him, but, um, but you know, that only lasted, I think about two seasons. Um, and so that, that seems about right for this show, you know, kind of moving on always switching uh, jobs. And this one sort of going back to a previous job of Ben's uh, with writing uh, for a magazine and running a magazine, um, not the same magazine, but still kind of, you know, th that that same uh, sort of feeling. So um, I don't know, really, really interesting to see what happens uh, as we move forward with that. Uh, I liked that storyline. I think we got some laughs from that. Um, and I love that Ben is going to be able to now, you know, stick with his passion and Dan is finally going to get to pay off the house. That has been obviously, uh, a, a matter of concern the last three or four seasons. Uh, I forget which season it was, maybe three, but the season finale, um, you know, had Dan almost losing the house. I think it was three. Um, but in any event, so this has been obviously something that that's been ongoing for a while with this family and, uh, you know, this house that they've lived in for at this point, 40 plus years. Um, and it's great that, they're, they're going to finally be able to pay that off. Um, you know, it's, look, sometimes it does take that long. Uh, we, we all kind of start with 30 year mortgages, uh, right. Unless you're, you know, a little bit, bit wealthy and, and can pay it off uh, quicker or, or pay it off outright. I, I don't know anybody personally that can do that, but, uh, in any event, it's, it's, you know, it's 30 years is kind of that base, but things happen. You know, certainly the pandemic probably pushed them back a bit and, uh, Roseanne's funeral costs and, uh, all of this stuff kind of, can slow it down a bit. So if he can pay it off, uh, you know, now that is freaking awesome. So I'm happy for him there. Um, now we get to the other section of this episode, the part that I think Lisey Gorenson probably was um, really champing at the bit to get to write about uh, because she loves writing these, you know, deep uh, stories with drama for Becky. And that's where Vice comes in. Um, so we have her uh, being an intern at a, uh, a clinic or, uh, you know, a drug and alcohol um, rehabilitation center or something. I forget what exactly they said. But uh, in any event, she really um, took 
to the job in, I think, some some inappropriate ways. You know, she really was diving headfirst, and I love that she wants to help. You know, that is Becky's way. It's always been. Um, however, she goes in a bit too far, um, so far that she is giving these patients her phone number, her email, and uh, contacting them around the clock. And they are contacting her, you know, with questions and, hey, I need help and this and that. Um, and at first, it's sort of, you know, a, a funny moment in the living room because uh, Jackie says, hey, you know, um, turn these challenges into opportunities, change your tunities, um, you know, and that was kind of a funny moment. But Becky really, really took it to the nth degree. Um, and Sean Astin returns, by the way, uh, as her, her boyfriend in this episode. And he is getting really concerned for her as well because he comes home uh, from a flight and he wants to share these pralines that he got for her. And she's like, I, I can't even really talk to you right now. You know, I'm going through this. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, you are an intern. You gave these people your information. Like, does that seem right? Does that seem ethical? You know, whatever. And she accuses him of only wanting to be around when she's happy and up. Um, and look, she's really reaching here. She's uh, grasping at straws. Nothing could be further from the truth with this character. Sean Astin has certainly been with her through a lot of ups and downs just in the short time they've been together. So um, I love that this character is, you know, it seems to be in for the long haul. Good on him. Uh, but she really, uh, you know, goes too far in uh, the next scene or two when she comes to the lunchbox to try and see if anyone will take in this woman who uh, got kicked out of the center uh, for making threats and, and this, that, and the other thing. And, of course, everybody's like, yeah, no, that's not happening. W what are you doing? You know, and Jackie tries to reason with her, talk some sense into her. Becky flips out and says, okay, fine, we're just going to drive around and try and find some real humans to talk to. And then it turns out this gal stole Becky's truck. So uh, then, you know, we see Jackie uh, trying to console Becky at home, giving her, uh, you know, the old Lanford life coach bit uh, and admitting to her that she has been seeing a therapist lately. And that is not new information. I, I don't believe it wasn't to me. I mean, um, even in the original Roseanne, uh, Jackie was in therapy. So I'm not sure if maybe that's not part of the canon anymore. I know they've sort of turned a lot of ideas uh, from that original series uh, and deleted them, essentially, from the lore of the show. But in any event, I, I think it's not really that shocking that uh, Jackie would be in therapy. So um, she basically said, look, Neville is uh, paying for this therapy. He wants me to go every week. But what if I only went every other week? Then I could go gambling at the casino and you could take my spot and, and get some therapy of your own. Um, and Becky really, really liked that idea. And then we also had, uh, Sean Astin's character come in again and try and console her in that way. It turns out he's a, a big crier. Um, I, I didn't love that part. You know, we, we've seen that in a lot of sitcoms as well. Most notably, uh, you know, friends, I guess when they've, they've opened up the, they actually did it twice on friends, once with Chandler and once with the Bruce Willis character, um, in his story arc. But, uh, you know, once they turn the, the waterworks on, it can't stop. Um, and so, Sean Astin's character is a big crier. I, I I hate calling him Sean Astin's character, but I forget his name, um, and I don't want to get it wrong. So you'll tell me in the comments, I'm sure. But in any event, um, that part was a little bit corny, and, and they used that as part of the tag scene as well. Um, but all right, that's fine. Uh, but look, overall, this was a pretty good episode. Um, certainly, it uh, helped Becky's character grow a little bit. And I love that this idea of um, her being in uh, a treatment program, well, uh, helping in a treatment program, but, you know, after getting sober herself and all of this stuff, you know, um, she is an alcoholic still, you know, a, a person in recovery is, is still, uh, you know, considered an alcoholic. And um, I love that they didn't just drop that, you know. Um, th I think a lot of other shows would have after you know, she got out of rehab or whatever. And that was, that goes back a while. Are we talking about um, season two, maybe, of the Connors that she was uh, in rehab? I think it was. I mean, it's been a while, but we've brought that up several times in the show, um, you know, from her 
dating people and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm in recovery. This is too early to date, um, you know, to certain other things. Like a few weeks ago, they had a drinking game uh, with, you know, her and, and uh, some of the other women of the show. And she made it clear that uh, she was not drinking alcohol. Um, and I thought, you know, listen, these are really nice touches because... As, as much as it stinks that a lot of the stuff from the original series in those last few seasons, at least, are not really canon for the show anymore, um, it's nice that there are some through lines still from the last few seasons of, of this particular iteration of the show. So I really like um, that she is going back and helping people. Like, that seems like such a Becky thing to do. Um, and they even talk about how it's adjusted her entire, like, outlook. Like, she comes in uh, to the living room and she's really... Um, a, you know, uh, a, a grumpy person, a pessimistic person, um, you know, and, and Dan's like, oh, that's not my ray of sunshine. I, I hear that's more of my winter solstice, you know, uh, pointing to Darlene. Um, so that was a funny moment, but yeah, I mean, Becky, very passionate about everything. So I love that. And, um, I, I can see why, uh, Lisey Gorenson really wanted to write this one. Um, and, and, you know, make it authentic for her character. Not that other people in the writer's room wouldn't have, of course, but, uh, I really like the, uh, the handling of her character there. Uh, all right. So overall, I think, like I said, this was a pretty good episode. I, I think, uh, there's not too much more to say. We'll kind of wrap it there. Um, but the MVP for the week, boy, oh boy, you know what? Just for pulling double duty in the writer's chair and having a great storyline, I'm going to give it to Lacey Gorenson. I think, uh, she got it just a few weeks ago as well. And I had said she barely ever gets the MVP. Um, you know, she's, she's usually, um, you know, maybe second or third in line, but, it typically falls to either John Goodman or Laurie Metcalf or whatever. But uh, no, I think for pulling double duty, we got to give the MVP to uh, to Ms. Gorenson on this one. And uh, Harris, I don't believe we saw Harris in this one, right? But everybody else we saw. We even got Mark, uh, you know, for a little bit too. Um, but yeah, so I, I, but I don't remember seeing Harris. Uh, if we did, it was very, very minimal. Um, but in any event, uh, I give the episode overall fire and vice. Uh, I, I don't know. Let's, let's give it an A minus. I, I, I sort of in between a B plus or an A minus. I, it wasn't the funniest of episodes for sure. Uh, which makes sense because the other episode that she wrote triggered, uh, definitely had some humor, but was a very, very serious episode, uh, throughout, you know, about gun violence and everything. Um, I, so I don't know, but you know what? I, I like the idea of, um, the hardware store going away and now we're going to go back to a magazine. I love, um, you know, Becky really going hard at, uh, trying to help people. So, uh, whatever, I'll give it an A minus. Look, if there's only going to be what, eight episodes left to this season and six next, next season, you know, why not uh, go out with some higher grades, right? There are two more episodes coming up in this season, flying, applying and wrestling gators, and then less money, more problems. All of the uh, season finale seem to have some kind of money, uh, kind of tie into the title, uh, at least maybe not all of them, but many of them. So uh, we'll see how those fare. But uh, let me know in the comments what you thought about this episode and uh, check out my other videos. Of course, uh, I just reviewed the new movie, The Fall Guy, very popular, um, and uh, as well, the new Anne Hathaway rom-com on Amazon Prime. I just reviewed that. Uh, but anyway, uh, check out my Connors video next week as well, uh, if you'd like. All right. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.